for the last year and a half, I have been home. I've been home alone with my novia the entire time, okay? And it's very exciting. We have only been married for 55 years, so we're still getting to know each other a little bit. So it's very exciting. And now that I'm home alone, I, here's what I've been doing. I've been practicing the piano, not just playing, but practicing. I've been lifting weights, exercising, and I've been doing my work, and I've been working on my languages. Just like you, I love trying to learn other languages. And of course, here in Southern California, it's been Spanish, so I want to tell you about my adventures. Here in Southern California at the local supermarket, about, oh, you know, 10 minutes from my house, they have a special time when old people can go shopping. You have to be at least 65 years old. So that's when I go. Uh, the last time I went there, uh, I took my groceries. Actually, this was the first time I went there. I took my groceries to the cashier to tell me how much it cost. And I noticed his name. His name was Fidel. Aha, he's obviously from Mexico. So I spoke Spanish to him. My Spanish is not very good. It's like language four or language five, but it's lots of fun. I spoke Spanish to him. He answered me in English. This is what they're expected to do. This is what they're told to do. So I was ready. I said, Fidel, tu puedes ayudarme. Mi meta es hablar español como ustedes. Hablamos español, por favor. He loved it because he felt he was on my side, on my team. Since that time, we have been speaking Spanish. And it's very nice talking to him. I'm getting better. In the beginning, it was hablar. Now it's charlar. We talk about all kinds of things. Someone once said, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, come sit next to me. So that's what we do. We talk about other people, we complain, and I'm getting better, no question. He speaks more quickly, more idiomatic, okay, more casually, but I'm not getting better from talking with Fidel. This is the main part of my talk today. I only talk to Fidel maybe two or three minutes each week because he's working. He doesn't have time to charlar conmigo, okay? He's got work to do, other customers. I am not studying Spanish. I am not doing grammatical exercises. I don't ask Fidel to correct my mistakes, nothing. I go home and I read in Spanish. I've been taking the advice of one of my colleagues, Benico Mason, and I've been reading lots and lots of very, very easy books in Spanish. English teachers know all about this. They're called graded readers, simplified readers. That's what I've been doing. And they're not bad. They're getting better over time. They're actually quite interesting stories. So all I've been doing is reading lots and lots of easy Spanish, and I'm getting better. I, ran, I, I don't speak Spanish in general. I only speak to Fidel. He's the only one. I ran into a friend of mine who's Mexican-American, and of course, I spoke Spanish to her, which I didn't do before. She said, Steve. Your Spanish is so much better. What are you doing? It's reading these easy books. Now, I've tried reading real Spanish, hard books. I discovered Isabella Allende last year. I read Zorro. It was too hard, but it was so good. You keep reading anyway. The story was wonderful. So I've been reading easy, easy, easy stuff, and it works. I have just presented my entire speech. I'm going to repeat it in more boring language, okay? Because I'm supposed to do that because I'm a professor, all right? I'm going to repeat it by talking about what we have learned over the last 45 years, and I'll do it in terms of hypotheses. The first hypothesis we call the acquisition learning hypothesis. And it says we have two different ways of getting better in another language. You can acquire language, you can learn language, and they're very different. Acquisition 
is sometimes called the natural way. A synonym is picking up a language. I was in France for two weeks and I picked up some French that really means you acquired it, you absorbed it. While it's happening, you don't know it's happening. You think you're having a conversation. You think you're re reading an easy book, but at the same time, you might be acquiring. Also, when you finished acquiring, you're not always aware anything has happened. You're not aware of it. Your feeling for correctness is a little bit better, but there's no dramatic change. We are very, very good at language acquisition. We are made to acquire language. We're not very good at language learning. Language learning is knowing about language. When we talk about rules, when we talk about grammar, we're talking about language learning. This is what you did in school. Conscious knowledge. The subject and the verb are supposed to agree. The third person, the S goes on the third person singular. That's conscious learning, okay? We're not very good at conscious learning. Error correction is supposed to help conscious learning. It doesn't very much, but it's supposed to. Uh, the child comes to English class <coughs> and says, I comes to school every day. And the teacher says, no, no, it's I come to school every day. The child is supposed to think, oh yeah, that S doesn't go on the fir third person, first person singular, it goes on the third person singular. In reality, error correction is very hard to do. It doesn't work very well, but that's what we think happens. We are not very good at language learning. We are not made for language learning. The next hypothesis kept me busy for about 10 years, the 1980s. You're muted. I yeah, don't know. Okay. There. It's called the natural order hypothesis. And it says we acquire not learn, but acquire the rules of language in a predictable order. Some rules come in the beginning, some in the middle, some come at the end. In English as a first language and English as a second language, the third person singular is late acquired. We all know people who speak English quite well, but they sometimes make mistakes with the third person singular. It's late acquired. Other rules like the progressive tense, John is playing the violin. This is early acquired. In first language, there might be six months to a year between the progressive and the third person singular. In other cases, the third person singular may never really come, okay? Now, some interesting facts about the natural order. You can't change it. You can't make something that comes late come earlier just by working on it. It's like good wine. It won't be ready until its time has come. This explains the frustrations that English teachers have. Students make mistakes on these late acquired rules and there's nothing we can do about it. The order of acquisition doesn't go from simple to complicated. Some rules that we think are very, very easy are late acquired, third person singular. Some rules that we think are very hard are early acquired. So the linguistic order is not the same as the order of acquisition. The order of acquisition is not the syllabus. I thought it was. I, may, I gave a paper in 1980 at the big TESOL meeting in Los Angeles. I said, I want to announce a major discovery. We have the natural order. All we have to do is teach along the natural order. So teach the uh, progressive early, the third person singular late. I was absolutely wrong. Not the first time and certainly not the last time. The natural order is not the teaching order. And this explains a lot of our problems, okay? The next hypothesis called the monitor hypothesis tells us, tells us what we can do with consciously learned language, okay? Consciously learned language is only available to us as an editor. 
if you're writing something and you think you're going to make a mistake, you can think of the rule and you can correct it. It's to correct your own mistakes. You're about to say something, it doesn't seem right. You think about the rule and you can correct it. It acts as a monitor or an editor, either before you say or write something, or if you realize you made a mistake, uh, or afterwards, etc. It's very hard to do this. Extremely difficult to edit your own speech or edit your writing even. There are three problems, three, let's call them constraints. First of all, if you want to use your conscious grammar to correct yourself, you have to know the rule. We don't know all the rules. I'm going to use the name of someone you probably heard of. I had a conversation with Noam Chomsky. Can you imagine that? It was wonderful. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the true living master. And Chomsky is the thrill. I was very excited. Uh, Chomsky pointed out, we have only described fragments, little pieces of language. Even the best grammarians don't know all the rules. The best teachers don't know all the rules. The biggest grammar books don't have all the rules. We are still discovering them. In fact, it's interesting that Chomsky says this, because Chomsky knows more about English than anyone who has ever lived. His research is analyzing English grammar, coming up with better solutions, and this will give us a clue what universal grammar is like. And he says he doesn't know all the rules. Now, when are these conditions met? When are you, when do you know the rules? You're thinking about form. And the next condition, you have time to apply the rule. Three conditions. You have to know the rule. You have to be thinking about rules. And you have to have time. These conditions are met only when we give people grammar tests. That's it. You take a grammar test. You study the rule. You're thinking about correctness. And you have time to put in the right form. Our studies, even when you give people grammar tests, they don't know the rules. They don't apply all the rules. They still make the usual kinds of mistakes. Well, if we don't acquire language from learning grammar, how do we do it? Let me give you a demonstration. I'm going to give you two language lessons. I'll use a language that you probably have heard before. Maybe some of you speak or you've studied it. I'll give you two very quick lessons and you tell me which of the two lessons you think is more effective. Here's lesson number one. Wir werden jetzt anfangen, Deutsch zu lernen, und ich möchte Ihnen voraus sagen, dass nach meiner Meinung Deutsch ist eine sehr schöne Sprache. Und ich hoffe, dass Sie alle sehr viel Erfolg mit Deutsch haben werden. W what do you think? Good lesson so far? I think if I kept talking to you like that, you would acquire German? Probably not. Here's language lesson number two. You have to watch me on the overhead. Das ist mein Kopf. Kopf. Verstehen Sie das? Kopf, ja? Yeah. Mein Kopf. Ich habe zwei, eins, zwei, zwei Ohren. Ich habe zwei Ohren. Und hier sind meine Augen. Ich habe zwei Augen. Eins, zwei. Und hier sind meine Brillen. Zwei Augen und Brillen. Ja. Yeah. Und hier sind meine Zigaretten. Hier sind meine Zigaretten. Wo sind meine Zigaretten? Ich habe keine Zigaretten. Ich habe keine Zigaretten. Zigaretten sind nicht gut. If you understood lesson number two, not every word, but more or less, I did everything necessary to teach you German. We acquire language in one way and only one way when we understand it, when we understand what people tell us, not when we understand how they say it, but when we understand what they say. The second German lesson, even if you understood a little bit, you acquired some German. Now, I want to share with you two amazing facts about language acquisition. Amazing fact number one. Language acquisition is effortless. No work 
All you had to do in the German lesson was to relax and listen to me make a few silly jokes and you acquired a little bit of German. Number two, even more amazing. And this one I think is mystical, okay? Language acquisition is involuntary. Like it or not, you all just acquired a little bit of German. You can't stop it. You can't turn it off. Just like if you keep your eyes open, you can't decide to stop seeing things. If your ears are normal, you will hear things with no effort. It is involuntary. Chomsky has discussed this. He says the language acquisition device is a mental organ. It works whether you like it or not. You can't turn off your kidneys. You can't turn off your liver just by thinking about it. You cannot turn off your language acquisition system. Given comprehensible input, you must acquire. I think this is wonderful. This is what we owe to Noam Chomsky, which is a fabulous insight in my opinion. Okay, a corollary. If this is true about language acquisition, if it comes from comprehensible input, talking is not practicing. If you talk more, you will not acquire any faster. Do you remember, those of you who are English teachers, do you remember your first time teaching English? You were in class and you decided to tell the students a story. Good idea. You were telling a story and your supervisor walked in and he said, no, no, you shouldn't be talking. The students should be talking. Wrong. You were doing it right. Your supervisor was wrong. The ability to speak is the result of language acquisition, not the cause. The research backs this up. The research supports this 100%. Writing more, talking more does not improve writing, does not improve talking. Wow. The ability to speak is the result of language acquisition. Now, I wrote a paper about this. I want to tell you a little about it. The, the, the idea of this paper is the real problem is when we're forced to speak, when we're not ready. When we're forced to speak, you have to use language that you've learned, not language that's acquired. And it's very uncomfortable, very difficult. I learned about this about 50 years ago when my daughter, <laughs> who's now 54, I don't know, yeah, uh, went over to the neighbor's house to play with the little girl. And my obligation was to go over and pick up both girls and bring them to our house. Okay. So I went over to the neighbor's house. I said, okay, I'm ready. Let's go. And the mom, the mom had an appointment. She had to leave. Actually, she had to go to the local community college where she was taking a Spanish class. She had to go to her class. She said, wait, I've got to take my medication. I've got to take my pill. She took her water, went into the kitchen, took a pill, said, okay, I'm ready now. Now we were very good friends, neighbors, family friends. So I said, what was that about? She said, the pill I took was Valium. Valium is an anxiety reducing medication like Prozac today. I said, why are you taking Valium? She said, Spanish class. It makes me so nervous. The expression she used, Spanish class freaks me out. Now, what is it about Spanish that makes you so nervous? Talking, being called on by the teacher and having to say things in class that I'm not ready to say. When I got home, I started looking at the research. Absolutely right. The number one activity that causes the most anxiety in beginning language classes is when you're called on in class and you have to talk. Wow, it's extremely uncomfortable and it doesn't help. Wow, those two are correlated, that's interesting. Well, it turns out that anthropological research backs this up. A researcher, an anthropologist named Sorensen did some research in, I think it was in, uh, 
near Argentina on the border, they looked at a group of people, 10,000 people. Now, 10,000 is not a lot. If you go to a football game, a soccer match, and there's only 10,000 people in the stadium, that's not a lot, okay? 10,000 people, 25 different languages. And they had an interesting rule. You cannot marry someone who speaks your language, okay? I violated that rule with my marriage. My wife and I both speak English. What can you do? It's too late now, okay? We have all these children, grandchildren, it's too late. Anyway, so the children in this group had to acquire mommy's language, daddy's language, the language of the small group around them, the language of the larger group, the larger group, their entire lives, they were acquiring languages all the time through childhood, through teenage years and adulthood. How did they do it? Well, Sorensen was a very good scientist. He interviewed them. Here's what he found. He found that number one, they don't force themselves. They don't speak the language until they feel ready. They listen to it and listen to it. And then when they feel ready, they start talking. As you see, Sorensen says, they don't practice speaking a language they don't know well. They may make an occasional attempt, but if it does not come easily, they won't try to force it. Isn't this beautiful? They allow a silent period and let it come naturally. Eugene Knight, another scientist, I read his work in those days, said the same thing. When people go to neighboring tribes in Africa, they work alongside the people there and they don't know the language. And they find if they just go there, listen, interact with people, after a while, they can hear the language and they gradually start speaking. In their language, to hear means to understand. Here's a big sentence coming. They assume they're going to be successful. I'm going to say that again because this is a big one. They assume they're going to be successful. They have confidence that this is going to work. It generally, in both of these groups, it takes about a year or two until they start talking. Guess what? I have good news. We can do a lot better. We can do a lot better than just immersion in the natural world. We have language classes. And in language classes, we can give our students comprehensible input immediately. Language classes are a very, very good idea. Okay, so number one, it comes gradually a little at a time and you don't force it. Another thing we have found out, this took us a long time to figure out, very embarrassing. Input should be interesting. Most language classes, it's not. In fact, it's about as boring as possible. I went through these classes, you did too. Languages, in fact, I think it should be more than interesting. I like to use the word compelling. Compelling means so interesting, you forget that you're listening to another language. That's what we do in language classes. And the classes over time have gradually been far, have been much, have been successful. So this really does work. It doesn't happen all at once. In language classes, we assume if you teach new vocabulary on Monday, they'll go home and study it. And on Tuesday, they'll be able to show that they know it. On Wednesday, they can pass a test. Not true. It's gradual. It comes little by little. The research here comes from the University of Illinois. Brilliant, brilliant, wonderful researchers. They found for English as a first language, if you're reading or listening and you come to a word you don't know, if you kind of understand it a little bit from the context, you get a little piece of it. You gradually build up the entire meaning of the world until you're finally comfortable. It comes a little at a time. You have to hear it 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 times until you're comfortable and it's spread out over time, not all at once. Each time you hear it, you may get one, two, three, four, five percent, and gradually you get the whole thing. In other words, we acquire language by understanding it, 
And we understand from context. That's the secret. Now, some people are opposed to that. They think it's all wrong. It has to be wrong. Because context will not always give you the whole answer. Context will not always teach you the new word. Here's a favorite example. You hear a new word and you see this picture. Now, does that mean finger? Does it mean fist? Does it mean direction? Does it mean okay? You don't know, but it gives you a little bit of a hint. It kind of gradually pushes you in the right direction. Over time, different contexts, you gradually pick up the word. This, if this were not true, or most contexts they found, most contexts are helpful. About 60% of the time, what you hear, what you think the word means is actually in the right direction. Less than 10% of the time, it pushes you in the wrong direction. Less than 10% of the time, it actually hurts. But most over about 90% of the time, 60 to 90% of the time, it actually helps, gives you an idea. Okay, uh, I'm gonna introduce, we're gonna talk about pedagogy, how to do this in class. And I'm gonna give you a new technical word. The hypothesis I'm gonna share with you is the conduit hypothesis. A conduit is a passageway, like a door or a corridor. And my claim is language teaching has three stages, three conduits. The first, stories. The second, reading stories, reading novels, literature uh, that are comprehensible. And the third is the real world, then you can do it yourself, okay? And we go through those, those three stages. I came to the conclusion about this, about the power of stories driving from where I live to the city. Uh, before the uh, pandemic, I used to go to Santa Monica. I live about 30 minutes from Santa Monica or 30 minutes from Venice. And I would go there twice a week, up and back, which is about one hour each time, half an hour each day, each way. So about two hours a week. I had good reason to go. My grandchildren are in Santa Monica and I'm hopelessly addicted to my grandchildren. And I like to go to Venice Beach where I could pump iron with Arnold because he was there. Very nice guy, by the way. So what do you do in the car 30 minutes at a time? I drove on what's called the Pacific Coast Highway. It is so boring. What do you do? Well, you listen to the radio. What's on the radio? The radio is news and talk programs. And all they talk about for the last 10 years is Donald Trump. I've had enough. That's absolutely enough. I'm tired of it. So I don't listen to the news anymore. Or you can listen to music. Now I have a background in music. It was my undergraduate studies. And I really like classical music. I like Beethoven. I like Chopin. I like the Beatles. I like the Bee Gees. This to me is heavy classical music. But you know what they did? These people, they took all the good music and put them on other stations you have to pay for. No, so I st all they got now is bad music. So I stopped listening. I then discovered that there were two libraries on my way into the city. One was the Santa Monica Library where my daughter worked. Isn't that nice? So I got to see my daughter, the librarian, okay? And they have a collection of audio books on CDs or on tape, or you can download them. I took out stories from the library, mostly CDs in the beginning, and then you can download them, et cetera. Now, the problem is all the stories were in English. That's all. Nothing in other languages. So I listened to English. None of them were classical literature and I'm a former college professor. I should listen to Shakespeare. No, they only had bestsellers. So I listened to bestsellers. To my amazement, the bestsellers were pretty good. I listened to detective novels. I listened to historical novels. I listened to legal novels. Most of them were excellent. 
the first series that I listened to, of course, Harry Potter. I listened to all seven Harry Potter novels. Harry Potter was written for us. J.K. Rowling, the author, they're all about education. They're all about the Hogwarts school and Harry Potter's adventures in school and his friend Hermione the and Ron, the classes they went to. And Rowling discusses each class in great detail. The, she, kept us, she kept me very interested. The hero of several of these books was the headmaster of the school, Dumbledore. Isn't that beautiful? So all of these books were discussions of education, the good classes, the bad classes, etc. Harry Potter is so good that I did what you did, what you still do. I drive home and before coming into the house, I listen to the end of the chapter because I want to know what's going to happen next, okay? That's how good they are. I've discovered these books. Now this, I think that, well, let me give you three words that are synonyms. Number one, fiction. Number two, stories, novels. They all mean the same thing. I think fiction is an excellent foundation for language teaching. I am not saying you have to use fiction. I'm simply saying it's a possibility. It could work for you as it has worked for me. It certainly worked for me with Spanish. I still listen to the graded readers that I told you about before. And then I'm gradually moving to the point where I can use, understand authentic Spanish. I'm getting better. And as I told you, they're real literature. They're good. They're interesting. They're getting better. Okay, the first stage in the model I've been using, and this is what I've gotten from my colleague, Vinico Mason, who developed this. The first stage is stories. Beginning language teaching is story time. That's what it is. What Dr. Mason does, she takes stories that she knows have stood the test of time, known to be good. She likes taking her stories from grim fairy tales. You can use any fairy tales, but they're extremely interesting and they always have some deep hidden meaning in them. So she tells these stories. The students listen to the stories and the teacher makes the stories comprehensible. In this case, uh, the teacher will draw pictures to supplement the stories, give extra explanation, et cetera. She doesn't tell the students, remember these words, not at all. She explains them to make the story more comprehensible. I will summarize our research very easily. In, you know, the, the, the uh, temptation is when there's a new word in the story and you draw a picture, give the student an exercise. So it reinforces the meaning, draw a line to the definition, three sentences with every word. You're better off telling another story. Wow, you get more vocabulary that way rather than studying the vocabulary, rather than doing flashcards. People worry, well, how will you make sure they get the important words, the frequent words? You know what? The frequent words will come back because they're frequent. They'll come back again and again, you'll get it the next time, the next time, um, et cetera. You gradually build up the meaning. Well, the second stage of this, stage two, is when we begin reading. Dr. Mason uses a method called guided self-selected reading. And this is the method I, I follow in my own language development. Um, guided self-selected reading is done like this. We want students to read what they want to read. We want students to read what's interesting to them. The best way to make sure is to allow the students to select the books themselves. So Dr. Mason comes the first day of class. The students have already been listening to stories. They've already heard two, 300 stories. She brings in the books from the library. Guided readers. You've seen these, the Newberry series, the Longman series, et cetera. You spread them out on the table, starting with the easiest level. The students browse, look through the books, 
and choose the ones they want to try. You don't have to finish every one that you start. If the book is boring, you can put it down. If it's too hard, you can try another one. That's the method and it really, really does work, largely because the books have gotten much more interesting. The people who write them have really caught on to interest. Let me tell you a little bit about the research done with this method and other methods, self-selected reading. Uh, in Dr. Mason's class, she asks the students simply to write down on the list which books they actually read. So we have an idea which books are working, which books they like. There's no quiz. We don't ask the students to write a summary of each story. We don't ask the students to tell us about it. They read the story and then they go on to another one and they select another one and another one. They can read hundreds of books in a couple of semesters. You can imagine how much interesting English they're being exposed to. As time goes on, they gradually by themselves choose harder and harder books. You need a good library for this to happen, of course. Dr. Mason had available a library of 5,000 graded readers in English. That's what we need. That's what we call good background, uh, et, et cetera. So what about the research? Uh, several of the students wanted to know whether they were making progress. So we asked them to take alternate forms of the TOEIC test, which is probably the most best known test of English in the world. The TOEIC goes from zero to a thousand points. If you reach 250, you're ready to start doing some reading. Uh, you get to six, seven, eight hundred, you are reached the point where you can start academic reading. You're pretty good. Here's what we found. For every hour of reading, the students gained an average of six tenths of a point on the TOEIC, more than a half a point, which means you can do the math. If you sit down and you do two hours a day of reading and you do it every school day, for a whole year, two years especially, oh my goodness, you're up to the highest levels of the TOEIC test and ready to do authentic reading. And it all comes from taking some time every day and relaxing reading books that you want to read. This is the new method. Well, I wanna show you some other research that comes to a similar conclusion. Uh, a study done with a former student of mine, uh, her name is Fei Xin. She teaches at one of the state universities in California. She worked with a student named Sophia. That's why we named the article Sophia's Choice, okay, after the movie. Sophia used to be, years before, an English learner. First language was Chinese. Uh, but by the time we, we met her, she already was pretty good in English and was considered fluent in English. At the school she went to, they would, this is a beginning secondary school. They gave the students a vocabulary, English vocabulary test, an English test at the beginning of the year, and then another English test at the end of the year to see how much gain there was. Sophia got worse through the school year. She started real high and by the spring, she got worse and worse and worse. Then the next fall, she would come back, take the test again. She reached her previous level and went even higher. She got worse at school, but over the summer, she got really good and was better than ever. Now, you know what she was doing over the summer. She went to the local public library and was reading books in English for fun. She was reading Nancy Drew. She was reading Sweet Valley High. She was reading Twilight. I tried Twilight. I couldn't get through it. My daughter said, hang in there. Try number two. I just won't go. But I like Nancy Drew. Nancy Drew is pretty good. Anyway, a lot of this stuff is excellent. Her mom, who was a college professor and co-authored the study with us, said, school is not helping my daughter. 
it's making her worse. She'd be better off staying home. And that was absolutely true in this case. I'm just giving you samples of the research here. C and Lee, another former student of mine, was uh, eventually became the dean of the university in Taiwan. Uh, she taught EFL, English as a Foreign Language, and she kept a record with her students of how much English they read on their own, voluntary, and how much voluntary writing of English within pen pals. The best predictor of English writing, how much they read. How much they wrote meant nothing. It didn't matter. It was the reading that counted. Uh, more studies. I'm just giving you a, a sampling. I didn't put this on the handout. I'll tell you about it. Malcolm X, a wonderful writer, wonderful speaker, very erudite, very clear writing, was the spokesperson for the African-American experience in the United States for many years. Gave public lectures on what goes on in African-American life. Um, someone asked him, phoned him, a uh, reporter said, what was your alma mater? What college did you go to? He said, books. He said, anyone who's heard me speak or has read the articles that I've written will think I went to school far beyond secondary school, far beyond college. He didn't even graduate secondary school. When he was a young man, he got into trouble. He was with the wrong kids, you know how it is. And they got into trouble, were arrested. They had to go to jail. In prison, he discovered the prison library. He became a reader. He said, you couldn't have forced me out of books. You couldn't have pushed me out of books with a wedge. When the guards came to make sure the prisoners were sleeping, he was under the cover with a flashlight, reading, reading, reading. His alma mater was books and more books. And the sophisticated style in clear writing, of course, came from reading. Now, I've got to tell you that I've just given you a few samples. If you're interested in more, you can read my book, which has it all. And my book is free. Um, I've taken my books, my old books that I could find, and most of my journal papers, and I've put them all on websites. And you can download them for free. And you, it's right there on the handout, sdcrashen.com. I don't do this because I'm a generous person. I would love to make money on my writings, but nobody can afford it. The books are much too expensive. If you want technical books about English, et cetera, they run uh, talking in American money, uh, at least $10, $15. Technical books, $50, $100. If you see one of my articles in a journal and you want a copy, you can write to the publisher, $40. The writer doesn't get the money. The journal gets the money. So there's no money in writing. So I've decided to give them all away. And at least people can read the stuff. That's why you wrote it. So now I'm, I'm jumping ahead. My books are all open to the public for free. If you download this and you wanna share it, I'm so happy. Share it, give it to people as birthday presents, whatever you wanna do, just share it, it's for free. Same thing with journal papers. Everything I write now in journals is what we call open access. I publish in journals that are free to the readers. If we don't do that, our profession is dead because nobody can afford this stuff. The only people who can afford this are currently university professors in first class universities that have these books in the library for you that you can look at for free. And that's very, very rare. Uh, other people are doing this. My, my colleagues are doing this. So I think this is good. My stuff you can find on sdcrashen.com. Uh, what have we found about this? Well, we know that reading in general is responsible for our language. People who read more spell better. Are you listening, Donald Trump? They spell better, okay? They write better. They have larger vocabularies. Their grammar is better. Nearly everything connected to literacy comes from reading interesting things. Interesting finding, fiction counts. 
In fact, people who read fiction do very, very well. Most of this research is based on fiction reading. When you compare fiction reading and nonfiction, those who read more fiction actually do better than those who read nonfiction. Most of what people take out of libraries is, of course, fiction. Nothing wrong with fiction. Now, this I'm warning you, this gets better and better. Okay, we're just getting started. If you read for pleasure, your language is your language gets better. Your academic language gets better. It's when you read fiction, it's not just funny stories. You're, they all contain academic language. Uh, my former student, Jeff McQuillan, I just mentioned him. He did an analysis of the seven Harry Potter books, the vocabulary, a lot of academic vocabulary. In fact, it will give you hundreds of words of academic vocabulary, words that are approved for students that will help you in your classes. Jeff looked at 22 books popular with young people, the ones I just mentioned. I know the Harry Potter books, uh, but also the Sweet Valley High books, et cetera. Huge amount of academic vocabulary, a major source. Uh, thanks to Jeff, I found out about Roll's, uh, Roland Rogers study. One million words, that's about a year's reading, of science fiction will give you 92% of the 300 plus science words that appear in all areas of science. Wow. I know this is true because it happens to me. My favorite genre has always been science fiction. Uh, when I start to read in other languages, I go to science fiction first. It's the most entertaining for me. Reading a million words will give you 300 words that you need for all areas of science. This explains a mystery in my life. I don't read that much in other areas of science. I read a lot in literacy studies, yes, academic stuff, but I don't read about research in biology. I don't read the biology journals, the science journals, but when I do, I understand a lot of it. I got the technical vocabulary from science fiction. That is so absolutely painless. Okay, we're just getting started. Relax, don't get too excited by all this because it gets better and better. I find all this unbelievable. People who read a lot get language. Not only that, people who read more know more. They know more about everything. They did a number of tests. This is Cunningham and Stanovich did the study back in 1993. I only discovered it about three months ago. And I immediately contacted Jeff McQuillan. I said, have you seen this paper? He said, yes, it is unbelievable. It's all interesting. It's true. They took college students and gave them a test of general knowledge, kind of what you would want every high school graduate to know. It included science questions. It included social studies, history, current events, as you see in the handout, personal finance, uh, uh, how does interest work, health issues, technology, cultural knowledge, multicultural literacy, gave them a huge big test on this. And then they gave them a questionnaire. What kind of activities help, help, are correlated with performance on these tests? Well, what did they find? The best predictor, familiarity with popular literature, best-selling novels, and magazines. The implication, people who read popular literature, people who read magazines know more about the world. I'll tell you what was not a predictor. Your grades in school. Bad news for Hermione, too bad. Those who read just ordinary books and had a good time, good stories, novels, fiction, knew more about the world than people who studied hard in school. Oh my goodness. You always knew that study didn't, wasn't very effective. Here's the data that shows it, okay? How well you did on a math test, didn't do it. How well you did on a reading comprehension test, not a good predictor. Your knowledge of television, nothing, you knew that. 
your high school grades were by far the best. By far, I'm sorry, high school grades didn't matter. Popular literature mattered. Wow. Well, people say, you know, the way to make up when we have, we've had the pandemic here in the United States, we said what we're gonna do so kids don't fall behind, we're gonna give them more homework at home. Do you think that works? No. Much better to read what you wanna read and have a good time. The research, Alfie Cohn, one of my colleagues I greatly admire, has shown that homework, the amount of homework you do, assigned work, has no relationship to school performance, to how well you do on these tests, et cetera. Homework doesn't help kids in elementary school, doesn't help kids, older kids. It doesn't help kids very much in high school when you do the statistics properly. Wow. So what have we found so far? If you read for fun, if you read novels that you think are interesting, you get better language and you get more general knowledge. I want to tell you an incident from my life. Here in the United States, every citizen who's a voter every few years is asked to serve on a jury. I've done that several times. I served on a jury about 10 years ago here in the local area where I live. And because I was a college professor, I was elected the head of the jury, the foreman of the jury. The other citizens were very impressed that I was a university professor. I didn't do a good job. The case was really something. It was called it was child abuse. A man who took advantage of a child. To me, the case was very clear. I spent a long time going over the evidence. 12 people on the jury, 11 of us thought the man was guilty. No question. The judge told us, if you find him guilty, we will not just throw him in jail. We'll get therapy. We'll find out. We'll help him. Okay. So I voted conviction. Every 11 out of 12 jurors voted conviction. One person said no. She felt sorry for this man. Misplaced sympathy, in my opinion. The jury was what they call hung. We didn't come to a decision. They had to bring in a new jury, do the case again. If I had read a novel by John Grisham called The Runaway Jury, justice would have been served. If I knew how juries operate, and I later, years later, I discovered all this, I discovered I could have had this jurist removed. I could have written notes to the judge. I could have done something about it. And we'd have saved taxpayers lots of money and a lot of wasted time and have come to a good decision. I learned more about this too in dealing with my cousin, Evelyn. Uh, my cousin, Evelyn, was the perfect older cousin. We all had one like this. Evelyn was my mom's best friend too. Perfect aunt-niece relationship. And Evelyn, about 10 years older, I used to go to her house. I'd play the piano. She'd play the violin. Her husband, Martin, also a wonderful person, had a degree in law. And Evelyn always said, you know, Marty knew a lot about the law and that helped us a lot. And after Martin passed away, she decided she would take a course in the legal system. I said, Evelyn, don't bother. Read John Grisham's novels. I sent her the novels. I paid for them. It's a tax deduction because I'm telling you about it. It's part of my work. She said, you're absolutely right. She and I decided if you read 10 John Grisham novels, it's like one year of law school. I think that's absolutely true. Most of what I know about the legal system comes from these novels. Readers know more. They lead other lives, etc. Okay, there's more. It gets even better, all right? If you read lots of good books, you read lots of fiction. We know fiction does a better job than nonfiction, okay? You get more knowledge, you get more language. You also understand people more. The research shows people who read fiction have more empathy for others, more sympathy for others, more understanding of others. It's because when you read fiction, you have led 
so many different lives. You've looked into the minds of so many different people in these novels, okay? So any novel will do it. Uh, you get more empathy. You also become suspicious of easy solutions to problems. What fiction tells you is that the world is complicated. Simple solutions don't always work. I wrote a letter to the editor that I'm very, very proud of. I'll send it to Nicole, maybe she can send it to you. So I'll share with you. I wrote a letter to the Washington Post. This was about nine, 10 years ago. And the Washington Post had some articles about Donald Trump, who was president at the time. And uh, they, he complained that people were talking about his spelling all the time. And people said, you shouldn't blame him for his spelling. We elected a commander in chief, not a speller in chief. This is misguided. Don't worry about Donald Trump's spelling. I wrote a letter to the editor and I wrote in the letter and I said, his spelling is very serious. We know from our research that people who read more are better spellers. Spelling comes from reading. We also know that Donald Trump is not a reader and he's very proud of it. He says, oh, I just have my staff just tell me about stuff. I don't actually read it myself. We also know that Donald Trump doesn't know anything. He doesn't know the names of leaders of other countries. He's not quite sure where he is. One time he said, I'm going on a trip to Israel to the Middle East. I said, no, no, Israel is in the Middle East. He doesn't know those things, okay? Rather embarrassing. And he likes simple solutions. We'll build a wall with Mexico. No, bad idea. We'll raise tariffs on China. That'll take care. It didn't. It's more complicated than that. By the way, in criticizing Donald Trump, I'm following the advice of a former president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, who lived 100 years ago. And this is what influenced me to write the letter. And the, the Washington Post actually published it. It was amazing. It is the obligation of the citizen to criticize the president. If you think the president should be criticized, if you don't do it, that is treason. That is being unfaithful and not being a good citizen. So I have followed the advice of Theodore Roosevelt and I wrote that letter and I will criticize the president when I think the president is wrong. So we have found several things here. We found, first of all, reading for pleasure, having a good time, okay, is good for language. It's good for knowledge and it's good to make you critical of what's going on around you. You reject simple solutions. You don't understand the world is complicated. Uh, Barack Obama was interviewed by the Guardian British newspaper. I really like the Guardian. It's one of the few newspapers I actually subscribe to. Who can afford this anymore? But I subscribe to that one. They interviewed a number of people and asked them about their reading. They interviewed Barack Obama. Talk about a contrast, oh my goodness. Uh, Barack Obama, former college professor, lawyer, all this stuff. They asked him, what about reading? What, what have you, what, how has this affected you? Here's his answer. And Barack Obama, uh, President Obama did not read the same research I read. He came to this conclusion on his own. When I think about how I understand my role as citizen, the most important stuff I've learned, I've learned from novels. Oh my. It has to do with empathy. It has to do with being comfortable with the notion the world is complicated and full of grays, but there's still truth to be found. It's possible to connect with someone even though they're very different from you. Wow. That is what you get from reading and from reading fiction. I have two other topics to do briefly. I'll do them briefly and then we'll have some time, I hope for some uh, discussion. Self-selection. We talked about the importance of self-selection briefly. I wanna say a few more things about it. I wanna begin by telling you my experience in secondary school, which is the same as yours. I'm betting on this. When I was in secondary school in the United States, we had required English literature classes. We had one year of 
American literature, one year of British literature. I did all the required reading. I wrote all the required papers. I passed the class. I don't remember a single one of those books that I read, not one. They're gone. The books that I selected myself, I remember all of them. I read science fiction and I also read baseball stories and the baseball stories were wonderful. They were excellent. They were stories about life, how to solve problems, um, et cetera. Those are the ones that you remember. Those are the ones I remember. Self-selection is the key. This, this was also discussed by Garrison Keillor, a uh, radio commentator, brilliant. He says, as a former English major, I'm an easy target, a sitting duck for gift books. For the past five years, I've gotten, past 10 years, past few years, I've gotten Dickens, Thackeray, Smollett, Richardson, Emerson, Keats, all of them great. None of them ever read by me. All of them now on my shelf, looking at me, making me feel guilty. You get a book as a gift from someone. And then a week later, they say, how did you like that book I gave you? And you haven't read it. And you have no intention of reading it. I have, for many years, I had the same shelf that Garrison Keillor had. I had all the gift books that people gave me that I never read. I figured out what to do. I put little pieces of paper. You know, the person says, for Steve, hope you like this. I put a paste piece, I paste it over it and I give the book to the local library. And it's embarrassing when they ask how much did, did you read the book? I, you know, awkwardly said, oh man, I hope I can get to it, you know, that kind of stuff. Because gift books are assigned reading. That's why we don't like it. It's not for us, okay? Um, <clears throat> Teachers know about this. Donald and Miller, no single practice inspires my students to read as much as the opportunity to choose their own books does. When students see I like what they choose, they trust themselves more to select their own reading. I'm gonna make two comments and then turn it over for questions. And I'm gonna answer the first question. How do we get students to read? How do we encourage their reading? I have stumbled across two recommendations that experienced teachers have made that I think are brilliant. Both of them are very short papers in the school uh, library journal. Number one, one teacher said, if you see a book in your school library that you like, take your pen, get permission library, and put a star in the inside cover. Put it back on the shelf. This shows you like the book. Students see the stars. They say books with 15, 20 stars, those are the ones they're gonna be curious about. Why is this book so popular? And they'll have a look at it. The other one, I got another article in the School Library Journal, brilliant idea. Brilliant researcher put comic books in the secondary school but did not allow students to take the comics home. Comic books and graphic novels. They put the comics there. To order to read the comics, you had to come to the library and sit down and read them there. After they did that, over two months, library traffic nearly doubled. The number of non-comic book, non -comic books taken out went up about 60%. So an increased circulation really helped. Well, this transitioned me to my final comment. Let's talk about comic books. I was a poor reader when I was in the third grade. I was put in the low reading group and it wasn't my parents because they were readers and they had books everywhere. My father solved it. He brought home comic books, gave them to me and said, Stephen, you can have all the comic books you want. I will pay for them. I started, I started reading comics. Within months, my reading improved. Today's comic books are better than ever. I'm going to close by bragging a little bit, if I haven't done enough of it already. 
I have the reputation, <clears throat> which I deserve, of being the world's number one expert on comic book research. And the reason I'm the world's number one expert on comic book research is that I'm the only one who does it, in my opinion. Not much competition, okay? Today's comics are wonderful. The revolution began <clears throat> in 1961, the Marvel Comic Book Company and the introduction of superheroes with real personal problems. One of the most important figures in English literature is Spider-Man, a superhero with deep personal problems all the time. I wanna tell you one Spider-Man story and then I'll stop. Well, I'll brag a little more after that. This is from Peter Parker, The Spectacular Spider-Man, issue 180, came out in the 1980s. Um, Spider-Man, and you know how he travels, he has these webs that he goes through the air and goes from house to house, is going somewhere and he hears an automobile crash, goes down to see what happens. A young lady driver has been hit by another driver and she's seriously injured. He calls the police and they come, the ambulance. He catches the driver, takes him to justice and he visits the girl in the hospital. She's had serious damage to both kidneys. She needs a kidney transplant. Do you know of any relatives, close relatives? She says, yes, my brother. He gets the, Peter Parker gets the address, changes to Spider-Man and hurries to the apartment. He finds the building where his, her brother lives, looks up at the, at the top of the roof and there's a man on the roof about to jump. Oh no, is that her brother? His name is Donnie, he calls it, is that Donnie? He goes scampering up the side of the house, side of the building in his Spider, Spider-Man equipment gets close to Donnie and calls out and says, Donnie, wait, don't jump. Donnie looks back, sees Spider-Man. Says, oh, Spider-Man. Spider-Man, I'm gonna jump and you can't stop me. I've got problems. I've got problems I just can't face. Besides, he says, what do you know about problems? You're a superhero. You don't have problems. And Spider-Man thinks of his problems. He thinks of the constant problems with his personal relationship with his girlfriend. He thinks of his job, the one that bothers him the most. His uncle was murdered by a burglar. Spider-Man couldn't, had, had a chance to stop the burglary, didn't, because, oh, it's not my problem, didn't know who it was. And he said, I will never make this mistake again. No man is an island, we have to help other people. And he thinks, I have problems. We all have problems. And he says in words that will live forever in comic book literature, you think life is easy behind, my, behind this mask? You think as I'm a superhero, I don't have problems? We all have problems. Life is problems. It's problems for all of us every minute, every day, nonstop. Of course, that's true. We all know this and we grow by trying to solve our problems, not by running away. He says, besides, if you jump, your sister's going to die too. He says, okay for my sister. He goes to the hospital, the transplant takes place. It's a success. Peter visits the brother and sister. They're both doing well. And as he's leaving the hospital, he's thinking, well, this one turned out okay. She's going to live, Donnie saved her. Things are going to be nice. But Donnie is still depressed. And there's nothing I can do about that. You can't solve everybody's problems. Well, go out and read a comic book. I think this is made for us, made for our reluctant leader, readers. I'm going to stop here and see if you have any burning questions. And if you don't have the right ones, I'll ask them anyway. Okay. Thank okay. you, Steve. That was amazing. Thank you very much. So I have a question in the chat. Someone left it earlier. So it says that what if uh, a school doesn't really have many books in the library? Would storytelling help students improve their English proficiency? 
I think storytelling is the right place to begin. That's stage one, of course, begin with storytelling. Fabulous. We like it, students like it, um, et cetera. But you must go to books. That's what libraries are for. And that's why you professional teachers are on the faculty. Your job is to support the school library. I'll give you a name. The name is Keith, K-E-I-T-H, Curry, C-U-R-R-Y, Lance, L-A-N-C-E. Keith Curry Lance is the number one expert on library research. I think he deserves a Nobel Prize. I have infinite admiration for him. His studies show in schools where there is a good school library, lots of good books, and a professional librarian, reading scores are higher. The library is the only place children of poverty can find books and things to read. And the way prices are going up now, it's the only place most of us can get our reading material. So the, thank you for asking the question. The crucial first step, work on the library. Rather than giving extra homework, work on the library. Make sure books are there, they're easy to use, easy to take out. And of course, school librarians are the best friends students ever had because they know how to connect students with books and they're generally very good at it. Thank you, Steve. We have someone raise their hand. So Dr. Kwasi, is that correct? Maybe you want to share your question. You can open your mic if you want. Are you still mute? Yeah, mute. Uh, yeah we can't really hear you. Maybe, no, it's not working, you're mute. Let me see if it's something that I can do. Good, good evening. There she is, there he is. There Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is a question. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to hear you today. I am in Africa, mm -hmm. sadly in Cote d'Ivoire. I am a teacher at uh, Alassane Ouattara University of Boaké, Cote d'Ivoire. I'm very happy today. So uh, I have a question about reading because my doctoral thesis focuses on the impact of extensive reading on the building of learners' vocabulary. So it is interesting to read and read more. But I have a question because in our context, in African context, which is in Cote d'Ivoire, when in uh, the classroom we want to apply these techniques, there are some difficulties because there are some students who are unable to read, even those who are in some higher schools are unable to read. So when listening to you, you are uh, promoting the reading and read, reading, essential reading. So what techniques can we use in order to improve the level of those who are unable to read? Okay, how do we teach beginning reading? That's your question. How do we teach beginners in reading who are low levels? Number one, lots and lots of very, very easy stories, of course. A little bit of alphabet, not much. This is the big phonics controversy. You know, the line in the bubble makes the buzz sound, et cetera. I would do a little bit of this, absolutely. It's going to make text more comprehensible. The only problem with phonics is that's all we do sometimes. You can learn phonics, and that's what they do. The line in the bubble is the b sound. You can also acquire it from reading. Get a feeling for it by reading lots of texts. Let me give you an example. I'm going to um, spell a word for you, and I would like you to pronounce it. Don't worry, this is an easy test. Okay. All right. C O M B. How do you pronounce that word? C L M B. Right. Come. 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 Like come over here. Okay. Yes. Come. Yes. The final word, uh, letter is a B, is a B. Yes. What is the rule? What about, why don't we pronounce the B? What's the rule? I'll give you another one. Why do we pronounce the B in? 
combination, but not in combing. You don't know the rule. Nobody knows the rule. Don't feel bad. I did that on purpose. I've done studies on this, exactly. We have acquired it. I can tell you the rule if you're curious. It won't help you. Uh, the B at the end is silent when it comes after an M, as in comb, okay? When it's by itself, you pronounce it. And when there's an affix, if the affix is grammatical, combs, it's silent. If it's grammatic, if it's um, not grammatical, combination, you pronounce the B. Everybody gets it right, but nobody knows the rule because you acquired it through reading, through listening and reading. So a little bit of phonics, not much, the basic alphabet, initial consonants, that's really all you need. And then lots and lots and lots of reading interesting, interesting texts. This is a tough one because the phonics industry has made a lot of money by telling everyone they need to do all phonics for several years before you even begin to read, which is false. Great question, thanks for asking. Thank you, Steve. I have two more in the, in the chat. So uh, Esther says, so reading aloud to non-readers could also help? Absolutely. Reading aloud to non-readers tells you more of this, you get more English language. When you get more English language, what you read is going to be more comprehensible. You can do better job predicting what happens next and you'll get more knowledge of the world. The more knowledge you have, the more comprehensible texts are. Good question, thanks. Yesenia, raise your hand. Yesenia, go ahead. You can open your mic. Maybe it's not, not working apparently. All right, I have another one in the top. Yes, she lowered it. So if reading is the best way to acquire a language, uh, and Luisa said that she agrees, how should a teacher uh, help students improve his or her pronunciation? Similar to what uh, you just mentioned. A big question. What about pronunciation? Reading will not help you with pronunciation, obviously. Okay. Let me give you our latest thoughts on pronunciation. And I think maybe five people in the world agree with me about this, okay? <laughs> One of whom is our hostess, okay? Um, I think we acquire pronunciation very well and very, very quickly. We acquire pronunciation by listening and everybody can do it. While we're reading, we don't need to pronounce the words. We just need to understand the meaning, but still you will expand in that way as well. Pronunciation is something we never have to worry about, in my opinion. Did I answer the question? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yesenia, maybe you can try again. She says in the chat that it doesn't really, if, not, if, it doesn't, if it's not working, you can leave the question in the chat. So I'm going to read one more. Um, it says, how can I help teens not feel afraid of speaking and actually notice the difference when they are scared uh, of speaking and they just don't want to do it? Well, I don't blame them if they're afraid of speaking. This is normal. We are forcing them to speak before they feel comfortable. I would leave them alone let them acquire more language and let them try again when they're in a situation in which they feel more comfortable and they understand what's happening a little bit better. It's normal to be hesitant in speaking. Hesitation in speaking happens when we force people to speak too early. Like my neighbor that I told you about, she was forced to speak, but she wasn't ready. Leave them alone, give them more input, more listening, more reading, and they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Steve. Right. So, okay. One more, uh, Diana. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Beautiful. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Krashan. Thank you so much for the information and all the interesting ideas. 
I'm the one who asked the question about the teens because actually I'm teaching teens, sorry. And it's kind of difficult for me because I don't want to push them, okay? I want them make, I want the students to feel free and not feel afraid. But sometimes we have to write some reports for the schools because we don't have enough time. It's kind of different when we are parents because we we give the opportunities and the enough time for them to feel not to feel afraid. But in the school is different because you have a coordinator, you have the the admin staff who's telling you write a report, you have to upload the grades, and you have to follow this procedure. And we don't have enough time, so that lead us to push the students like you have to do it now. You see, and it's kind of difficult in that type of environment to give them more and more time. So yeah. if you have any idea like how to do it fast, <laughs> but I mean, not that fast, but how to, how to make them feel uh, sure of reading in public, okay? And in a, in a certain period of time, I mean, in a school year, I don't know if I make myself clear. Unfortunately, I understand you completely. Okay, thank you so and much. It is very frustrating. I share your frustration. Exactly. <laughs> the person to blame is me. It's all my fault. I have failed you. I have been working on this theory. Well, wait a minute. I've been working on this theory for nearly 50 years and nobody buys it. The public does not believe it. Your supervisors at your school don't believe it. And they force you to do things that violate the theory all the time. That's the problem. And the reason I have failed, number one, the research is buried in technical and expensive books that are very poorly written, okay? So, this is a problem and it's not getting better, it's getting worse, all right? Because people are interested in their careers. This is about, and I have not penetrated that barrier. It's actually gotten a little better in previous years uh, until the, uh, till the uh, pandemic began, I was dependent 100% on what I wrote. Thanks to the pandemic, it's now Zoom. It's now what we're doing. The first year of the pandemic, I gave like 70 talks, okay? And people started to understand what I was talking about. They didn't have to buy my expensive, incomprehensible books. So this is a question of time until this gets around. The last couple of years, my career in one sense has done very well in that the ideas are getting around, more people understand them, but we have a long, long way to go. When I go to the schools my children go to, grandchildren go to, nice people trying to do the right thing, they have no idea. A little bit here and there, some do, some don't, but for the most part, when I look, at, oh, the worst part is to look at college catalogs. I look at a college catalog of the near, nearby community college, and they offer beginning French, beginning German, beginning English, horrible. It's like the year is 1925. They're all doing grammar and drill and all these things. So this is tough. It's not your fault. It's the fault of the academics who uh, have not been successful in convincing the public. Thank you, Steve. Okay, last question from Juan Carlos. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Krashen, for allowing us to hear you. I was I was in one of your conferences in Bogota, and uh, it was a, it was life changer. Um, I honestly believe that doing storytelling uh, does a lot for students. I I just have perhaps two questions. The first one is: uh, Is there somewhere in your website uh, something that could probably help us improve our storytelling techniques so that we could perhaps approach our stories a lot better to our students. And the second question I would have, uh, that would be, um, since comprehensive input is key to language acquisition, uh, 
if if we speak in a comprehensive well if we use comprehensive input to our students but sometimes they don't have enough uh lexical resources to answer back would it be okay for us to take an answer back in their first language would that be okay absolutely this is what natural approach did at the very beginning this is say spanish for americans um south for north americans you would give the lesson in, in, in uh, Spanish, they were allowed to answer in English. I thought that was a great idea. I still do. I think you're right. Do it and tell us about it, especially okay. among beginners. In terms of storytelling techniques, I'm not an expert. I've read a few good books. Jim Trelease's book was very good. T-R-E-L-E-A-S-E, -E, called the Read Aloud Handbook. Again, I'm sorry? T-R-E-L-E-A-S-E, -E, Jim Trelease the read aloud handbook, but I am not an expert. I would go to watch good storytellers, see how they do it. That's the best way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Right, everyone, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy also to invite you all to our course. Uh, it's gonna be at, by the end of July and August, uh, given by the professor. It's an eight session course on all uh, language acquisition theories and research. So yeah, if you are interested, you can write us, uh, academy at oliviacorporation.com. Uh, you are all very welcome there. We'll be uh, opening the enrollment tomorrow. So feel free to ask for details to that uh, email account, all right? So thank you everyone for coming. It's been a pleasure to have you all here. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve for all this wonderful presentation. Uh, I can see many comments in the chat that everyone is very happy with this uh, webinar. So thank you everyone. And we hope to see you soon at another time. Let me explain one thing. Absolutely. You will notice that Nicole refers to me as Steve. Yeah. <laughs> I have asked her to do that. I have to tell you, I am not the real Dr. Krashen. The real Dr. Krashen is our son, mm -hmm. PhD in mathematics. Can you believe that? Amazing. <laughs> Children succeed where their parents fail. He's a professor of math. He's the real one. And when I grow up, I want to be like him. So that's the explanation. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. I hope to see you soon at another event and in our course. Absolutely. So thank okay. you. Okay. Goodbye.